congratulations. That was a beautiful, wonderful, compassionate film. Thank you, bro. Um, I see it as a movie about healing, which is, I, I think it's very appropriate these days. <laughs> I feel like uh, we're kind of in a world of, um, it's very easy to hate on people and not let that go. And so I just want to sort of jump into that and ask you, like, where, where does that come from? Um, I think it's just going through some things in life, you know? I think it's getting through some things in life um, get into the other side of those things, you know, and uh, putting all of that into the movie. Um, it's kind of everything I believe in, and I believe in where we should be right now, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. So, can you, I mean, I hate to be so, like, digging in even further, because I kind of do want to ask you, because I really want to know, because it feels very personal. It feels something that's very, and I, sort of, I can sort of see, like, themes that you touch upon in Krisha and how it's sort of revisited in this film in different ways. And so, so I guess I wanna, I wanted to talk to you about that in terms of like, you know, like there was like family conflicts and, and dramatics and like just how, um, how sometimes there's like people in a family that you just can't get along with and then you have problems with them and so forth. And then this film also touches upon that too. So I wanna ask you like what's, um, when you sort of look at those two films right now, like what's your, sort of take on it. Yeah, um, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, they're both uh, extremely personal. Um, uh, this one had been brewing for, uh, well, it was brewing for a really long time, but I didn't know how to put it all into a coherent uh, narrative and tell a story right. with it. There's a lot that happens in the movie. So there were different aspects and different things. And, um, um, it's kind of hard to, I don't know, it's hard to sum up, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of uh, uh, personal stuff with loved ones, um, getting through some stuff. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, like the end of the movie, everything in Missouri is real and, and kind of recreated, and that was a, a big traumatic, uh, you know, thing in my life, and um, pushing to, through to the other side of that, and... A lot of it. I'm just sounding like an idiot right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I want to be respectful about how much you're willing to share, too. No, you know, I think I'll, I'll just ask you a more general question, which yeah, is, yeah. Um, you know, like, after you have made this film and then where you're at now, having, yeah. I'm a senior student, <laughs> watching it so many times and so forth, like, what's, what, what is it that you have learned about yourself after making this movie? Yeah. Um... It's a good question. It's it, it's weird because we just uh, we worked on it for a long time and literally finished it fully like a few weeks ago. Um, and it's hard again. It's hard to sum up. I had like a religious experience at the end of the shoot, and um, incredible. I don't know. It's incredibly cathartic. I got to make something uh, I I deeply cared about with human beings. I deeply love, and all putting that into something. And you know I. I do think with this movie, um, uh, it, it was a big difference from like the other things I've done so far as it was about kind of trying to push through to the other side and heal and grow and, 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 and feel that stuff. Um, and that's where I'm at as a human being, I guess, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the dark times, it's all consuming and it's all bad and it, it cause right. it is, that's how it feels at the time. But then life keeps going in a lot of circumstances and, um, all you can do is try to s sort through the pieces and heal. So that's just basically the whole spirit of the movie, and that's what it that's what it felt like writing it and then making it with all these people I love, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to switch gears a little bit too, I want to commend you on making some of the most anxiety-inducing driving <laughs> scenes in a movie because. I mean, I just feel like I'm gonna get into the car, my, the car tonight and driving home and I would not drive my car the same way again. It was just a sense of impending doom. And I'm, yeah. I, I want you to talk about that in terms of uh, that as a design and how you play with that tension. Yeah. Well, uh, so it kind of, I think a big part of that is the spinning camera inside of cars. <laughs> Um, so for me, you know, it starts with that opening shot and like when I was that age, 
uh, you know, first my space was my room, you know, cause people couldn't mess with my room. That was my space. And then it became my car as well. Once I got a car and I think being in your car with, uh, the person you love, uh, is the most free feeling in the world. And I just wanted the camera to feel free, but, uh, Ty and Lex's love is, it's like a bottle of fire, you know? Um, so it felt like the only way to kind of convey that, uh, was to, was to spend with them. Um, and, uh, so that's there and, uh, I don't know. It, it's funny cause like it's, it's chaotic and free. It's hilarious that I didn't quite intend to people be, to be so terrified from the camera spinning inside the car. Um, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, and we, it's, it's sort of a motif in the film, I think too, cause the film's kind of like, uh, the macro and the micro, you know, and it's a lot, but it's also intimate and, uh, and dichotomies in our lives and good and bad and everything. So, um, that spinning camera and then recalling it at other times, uh, it just feels like love to me at times and love, love can be scary and free. And, uh, but then we come back to it later with Luke and Emily at a similar state in their relationship, but there's a lot of melancholy attached to it, you know, cause we've gone through everything else in the film. Um, and then other times, yeah, it's just, as a whole though, that and all the driving stuff, everything really visually is just to try to be honest to the characters. It's everything we're doing with any kind of film grammar or music or sound, it's just trying to get you closer to their head spaces. So like for that stuff, it's trying to get you closer to Ty's head space. When Emily takes over, it's trying to get you closer to her, her head space. And hopefully uh, that's why I give that's why I like getting a warning now before the movie of like, it's a immersive experience, uh, but stay with it. It goes a lot of places. Um, Cause it was kind of designed that way. And I just hope, uh, I don't know. I hope you just kind of feel the movie with the characters the first time you see it. And then uh, the dream would be, there's a lot more to think about as it sits with you for, for a minute, you know? Right. Um, you were from Texas and then you moved to Florida, which is where you're based right now. Um, I, I feel like there's a sort of element of a love letter to Florida in a way, especially visually and how you catch a Florida. So can you can you talk about how Florida has inspired you for this story? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I lived in Texas all my life until I lived in Florida. That's where I am now, uh, and I'm still in love with it. You know, I moved to Florida uh, uh, for my girlfriend. I'm still in love with her, and. Uh, uh, I think I think love's a big part of this movie. You know, it's um, I think it's about the you know love can be a very powerful thing, and it can be an enlightening, all-consuming, opening thing. It can also be a destructive thing. You know, love can be toxic at the same time. So just trying to explore that and all the aspects. But so just taking it back to Florida, I'm still in love with Florida, and uh, uh, you know we shot in Broward County. It's where my girlfriend grew up. It's where we lived for a number of years. And um, I just wanted to do it justice. You know, there's an energy there and um, it, it's, I'm just obsessed with it. I'm fascinated by it. I don't know. And I just wanted to, to wanted to do it justice in the film. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can open up to um, the audience right here. Um, first of all, I want to just support gratitude for particularly the <coughs> behind you. Um, I would say, uh, it was beautiful just to see that capture, particularly the vulnerability of Ronald as a black man. Yeah. You don't get to see on screen as much. Um, you get to kind of see the other side with the, his talk with uh, Tyler about what you had to do to be, you know, I'm doing this because I want you to be alive. Yeah. So like this was such a beautiful scene. So first, thank you for that and just the gratitude um, as someone who's a black man to see that, that vulnerability, which I think is so important. Um, but the question I have, and this is going to be a little different than maybe you might have expected, but I want to kind of speak to what you're thinking about the juxtaposition between Tyler and Luke. Yeah. And between, and particularly how, in that particular that scene with Tyler where he had to be the perfectionist, and Luke could be goofy, fun, loving. I want to speak to like how, why you chose that, especially if you chose that particular with race comes involved. And what Absolutely. You well, it's a lot, a lot's attached to it. Um, I think one thing to start with talking about it is how collaborative the movie was. And um, uh, it started with Kel, uh, Kelvin Harrison Jr., who's Tyler in the movie. I, he's a phenomenal actor, amazing human being. 
Um, we basically, uh, we met on my last movie and we loved each other and wanted to make something special together. And uh, I had ideas for this movie, but it wasn't all latching into place. And we started talking about it. Um, it started coming together more and then uh, basically I was like there's two roles you can play in this and he gravitated towards Ty and uh, we um, we opened it up and explored it together you know and, and and had all these kind of mini therapy sessions about our past and being alive at that age and commonalities and differences and everything and else in our experiences um, and just trying to understand each other and uh, uh, so there's that and this big collaboration so this so the movie kind of organically uh, became a black family because of that and because um, because of Kelvin and it grew out with everyone else. Um, so we just wanted to explore this side, you know, and we wanted to explore basically for Tyler, I think his, his character arc is something, I think in the wrong hands, it becomes a cliche and it becomes, um, it becomes a disservice, you know, and we, what, what Cal was really excited about is just bringing humanity and empathy and understanding to that and understanding how we go on this on this journey with this kid, you know? And um, and for Luke and for him being white, it also happened organically. I met, uh, I met Lucas Hedges and we loved each other and wanted to work together, but um, it's basically, I think it's, it's the same thing on the opposite end of the film. Like I think with Ty, if it's handled in the wrong way, it's a cliche. And if for Luke, if it's handled in the wrong way, it's a cliche, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's more privileged and doesn't have the same pressures that Ty does and, um, doesn't have to go through the same kind of things. And, uh, yeah, basically we just, again, we wanted to treat that honestly. And, um, yeah, it was all of that sort of. Yes, sir. Uh, how often do you use a two camera setup and has Kanye seen the movie? <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? Um, how often do you use a two cameras set up and has Kanye seen the film? Kanye uh, West, I'm assuming. Uh, two cameras really am anytime I can. Uh, yeah, anytime I can if it helps the performance and it doesn't, um, doesn't get in the way and mess up the scene, you know what I mean? So I'm trying to think, really, there's a lot of intimate the scene at the lake you know those two cameras the uh the scene at the beach with uh which is sort of echo of that scene with um ty and alexa on the bench uh that was two cameras and any time that i think we can use it to just uh, ultimately with everything in the movie it's like you know we shot listed to death we try to do all this stuff and all this uh, yeah all this kind of cinematic stuff but at the end we just want to get out of the way and not get in the actor's way so anytime we can do that, I try to do that. So we did it a lot, like we always had two cameras, uh, certain driving scenes, long dialogue scenes, I don't know, anytime we can just try to make it feel like we're not there, we do. And I just wanna prop up the actors and make them feel great and do everything we can. Um, Kanye, I don't know if you've seen the movie, uh, we got his song and the Pablo poster uh, and we really lucked out and I, all this, I don't know if any artist has seen the movie. Like I basically write letters to everyone and I talk about, um, what the movie is, what it's about, what it means to me, why I love their song so much, why I'm using their song in the film. And, uh, and then I send it into the ether and then they say yes or no. And Kanye said yes. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. I was really blown away by the movie, and I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to uh, the aspect ratio shifts. Sure. So the question is about the uh, aspect ratio shifts in the film? Uh, it, basically, aspect ratios are kind of doing the same thing everything's doing. It's all coming from the characters. So um, first it starts with Ty, uh, and his world is basically... Uh, there's a lot going on and it's 185 widescreen wide lenses trying to feel it all and then his world starts sort of dismantling piece by piece um, big thing Cal and I talked about too is it's like it happens so fast he doesn't have time to process and react and it's almost like a panic attack and where f I hope it feels like you're forced into that with him and understanding it with him so as that's happening the ratios kind of seizing in with him you know and we go from like 
185 to 240, then then 266 with anamorphic lenses. Um, you know, when he starts uh, for an altered state of mind, it's uh, with flares and a shower of focus, it just feels more expressionistic and right where his head is until eventually at the end of his story, we end in 133, as his world's fully fallen apart and this tragedy's happened. Um, and uh, I think also 133 is like the best ratio for faces. Uh, and it's a key moment for the baton pass when his sister takes over. And then, you know, I think his sister's trajectory is, um, for for me and what Tay and I talk about, it's a, it's it's sort of a story of like trying to love yourself again, um, in and trying to heal in the darkest times. So so if the ratios with Ty feel like the world crumbling in on you, I hope with Emily it feels like a burden's being lifted off and we're opening back up. So we're just doing the reverse on her side of the story, and we're going from one three three to. Uh, well, we skip 2-4, we go to anamorphic and 266 uh, na native, and then we go to 185 at the end uh, and open it back up. Um, and uh, yeah, where we kind of started the film. Yes. Can you explain the use of natural light in your movie and why you made that decision? The question is about the use of natural light in a film and why um, they made that decision. Uh, I think for us, the kind of spirit of the movie we hoped and what we were after is, uh, you know, I think the movie's about dichotomies a lot, dichotomies in our lives, and like for the, for the light, it was like, we wanted it to be naturalistic, but then expressionistic. We wanted it to be in the, the kind of the spirit of the movie, like uh, refined and intentional, but also scrappy and messy. So the light itself, like at times it's, we try to make it as naturalistic as possible and using that naturalistic light and making it feel real. But then at other times we kind of push it, uh, to feel expressionistic and it's always being motivated by where the characters head spaces are basically. And we're just trying to do whatever feels spiritually right to where Ty or M are at on their respective journeys. You know? Can you actually talk a little bit more about, um, do you have kind of like a special pro like different process that you work with each of these actors in order to draw out these just like wonderfully intimate moments from them? Well, I think, I think for this one, it, it started with Cal and it started, it was simple. It was like, we love each other. We want to make something we care about. Uh, and let's just collaborate as much as possible, you know, and then it that energy siphoned to everyone else So even if it was Like Tay and Lex, I didn't know at all before this and they just sent in traditional audition tapes But then I connected with them. I thought they were great uh, We we either Skyped or met in person and it was like a connection and a vibe. So right there it was like uh, I think this person's a good human being. I just feel connected to them. I think, I mean, I know they're really talented. And then it just becomes super collaborative. And for me, it's like, it's all open. You know, I just want, I want to hear everything you think, whatever you got, how can I make it better? How can we build this up? How can we do anything? Um, and uh, it's kind I don't know, it's kind of all consuming. It could be, it could be, um, it could just be simple text messages and pre-pro and during the production to like, we, we never really rehearsed and stuff, but we'd get together and have little meetings and go over scenes and talk through things and dynamics. And and then um, if, if they had new inspiring ideas, I'd go off and write and send it to them. And then uh, it'd keep going like that to where we sit when we would shoot. Um, sometimes it'd be very close to what we intended or sometimes we'd do the script and then just start riffing and do other stuff. So that, that kind of went through with everyone. And it was extremely collaborative and um, yeah, it, it, you know, for me, I was just trying to keep it simple, like trying to make, you know, as much of a creative family as possible to where it was just love and trust and we wanted to build each other up, you know? Sorry, I missed a question there. There was someone, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, oh, yes, sir? Well, I don't have a question, but I oh. want to first thank you for making such an incredibly beautiful, socially relevant movie. But then, as the father of two young men, I want to damn you straight to hell because it tore up. my stomach was in knots, man. So you captured every fear, every positive emotion that a parent could possibly have. But thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. There's one question in the back. Yes, yeah. You. Uh, I have another question pertaining to the music. Yes. Um, so it's really, I was so moved by the movie and uh, I thought great music choices. And um, I was curious to ask you about your collaboration on the score. 
the court. Uh, it, it, oh, so, I'm um, sorry. I don't know. The question is um, about the music and then specifically the score, which is by uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Um, uh, I got very blessed to work with uh, my heroes, and um, um, it, it was amazing. I was very scared when I sent them a script with like 36 songs embedded in. None of them were Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> and I thought they'd be like, where the hell do we fit into this? Uh, and it was the total opposite. They were excited, and um, so it was like, yeah, where the hell does score fit into this? And uh, uh, it was exciting. So it, there was a bit of um, just experimenting, and I think what we came upon was uh, trying to make the score feel like um, coming out from uh, Tyler and Emily, you know, and their spirits, because there's all these songs in here that. Um, you know, I think are connected to their world and connected to their emotion, but they're still not fully coming out from their headspace. So we, that was the separation in the score. And um, we do things like, uh, uh, or Trent and Atticus would do things, they take sounds throughout the film uh, and repurpose them and use them musically and work that into there. And, but even to the motivation of like using uh, like simple piano themes were because of Tyler playing the piano, you know? And we really wanted it to feel kind of internal, but also the spirit, because like Ty and M, you know, they're siblings, and um, that's that's a that's a huge giant connection. But they rarely share the film together. They're in their separate perspectives. So we wanted to spiritually link them as much as we could. Um, that's why in scores not even introduced for the first time until Ty gets the news from his shoulder, and then. Uh, a few key moments, like a, a big moment it's used and we introduce this theme is when he breaks down with his sister and then we bring that back when she starts taking over the movie and then when she's on the back half of the film um, wrestling with uh, with her grief and uh, her emotions towards him and bringing that back at the end and we just, it, it sort of became this spiritual link uh, that hopefully felt true to them and, and linking them and also the two parts of the movie, the yin and yang, you know, and the different tones. It's like, it was a huge thing to, uh, I think, uh, connect, connect it all, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, it was a, just amazing working with them. I felt very blessed. Oh, one question way to back. The question is about the use of color and that sort of like um, blur, blur light sort of transitions that happen and, um, and your intention and how you use those. Um, I, I think it's a lot of things. One, um, the, uh, the, the, especially those color interludes were kind of, uh, the spirit of those were in the script. The script was kind of really unorthodox. Uh, it had music embedded in, it had colors, it had big fonts, small fonts. Um, uh, aspect ratios mentioned in camera movement, but all being the purpose of trying to capture what the film uh, was trying to to be and feel like. So the, the color interludes for me, um, I kind of they f I wanted them to kind of feel like the spirit of Tyler and Emily coming through and connecting. If that makes sense, again, it's kind of like what the score is doing too. It's almost like I don't know if it's the subconscious of them or the spirit of the movie, but. It just felt emotionally right. Um, even to the fact, you know, later when Emily's laying in bed and she closes her eyes, it's like, I want her to feel like we're going inside her head and she's searching um, for light and like healing inside her. Uh, but instead of, I don't know, just objectively seeing that, I kind of wanted to try to go inside her head and subjectively feel it uh, to where when we open it up and, and light takes over and we go to 240, it feels like her trying to take this new direction in her life. And, um, yeah, there was that. There was also just the fact, like my last movie was dark and muted and depressing, and uh, uh, I wanted color, and I wanted, uh, I don't know, also Florida is just colorful and beautiful and stunning, so, uh, you know, it's the end of the movie, the, the song, Sound and Color, you know, it's, like, it's very much the spirit of what I think this movie is, uh, so yeah, it was all of that. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I mean, the, th the movie was 
elements of the movie were brewing for so long it was like everything i made before this it was always like filing stuff back like one day there's going to be that that movie it didn't have a name it didn't have characters but it was like always that thing so the funny thing by the time i actually started doing real writing it wasn't other movies it was like um it was real life stuff from myself loved ones the collaboration with cal it was music it was florida um and i wasn't watching any movies but that being said since i think elements of it were in the head for so long it was like in that time i was like studying movies so it all worked its way into there and um but now it's very hard for me to say exactly what all it was like when i you know first thoughts of this i was like in high school myself and i saw days and confused for the first time and uh and uh you know i thought like oh what could a contemporary days and confused be like and like i was listening to music and thinking of images it's very different from the movie here <laughs> um but that was like one example and then like as i go on and on and you know going through things in my life and like uh uh tearing my shoulder from wrestling and getting on some other side of stuff and then like tyler's story started forming and then um and then m started for oh that was another i remember when i saw chunking express that like uh i had an epiphany and that um you know blew my mind open for the idea of the structure too that was probably like five or no like seven years ago um and it could be a brother and a sister and the two halves and and their connection how does yin and yang make the whole and then i think there's a ton of other i mean there's like everything from like punch drunk love to ordinary people to boogie nights to um tree of life to all this stuff that i think spiritually made its way in there cassavetes and everything else but when i was actually trying to make it um it was almost it, not watching or drawing on anything yeah I, oh steven is that you yeah, yeah your question uh, Yeah, uh, it was a lot. Like it was constantly evolving. You know, like from the like Kel got a, a version of the script like eight months before we started shooting, and we'd go through and make detailed notes and do all these changes. And and then when I was saying before, like the collaboration with the other actors when they came on to where so it was constantly evolving, sort of in the pre pro and script phase to shooting. Um, and on the day, that was another thing. Like we wanted to just feel so in tune and like we knew what, or in touch with what we were trying to make that um, we were all in it together and we could change it or um, uh, evolve from it on the day, you know? Um, so production, it would kept, keep evolving. And then editing, uh, it was the hardest edit I'd ever done. I shot way too much. Uh, I shot enough for a four hour movie. And, uh, you know, our movie almost <laughs> fell apart because the Bond company realized I cheated the page count. And uh, it was a 150 plus page script. And uh, so, so, but we shot all of it and I had enough for a four hour film. So editing was very hard and uh, it was hard to uh, uh, get it to a tight film, well, as tight as we could make it that felt spiritually true for what it was and what it was trying to go for. That was uh, very, very hard. Um, it took, we edited for about a year. Um, yeah, so I would say though, long-winded answer of like where the spirit of what we wanted to make and what we set out to make is very much what the final movie is. But all along that way, it was constantly collaborating and evolving and, and shifting. You know? uh, any other questions? How, how are we doing on time actually? Are we good? Do we have, can we ask more things? More questions, okay. Uh, actually on that note, did you have enough time to shoot a 150 page script or did it feel like you were <laughs> well, <laughs> playing with fire? I don't know. <laughs> a bit, a bit. It okay. did feel like we were playing with fire, but um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I have my same VP that we've made every movie with and the actors are amazing, so. I think that was huge, you know, and we worked really fast. Uh, uh, we had, we, yeah, we had some insane days, but we did. We shot almost 150 pages. We almost got there, um, and uh, but it was amazing. Yeah. Cool. Um, one more question. Yes. So 
So the, the comment is about the underwater, underwater sequence. So your observation is, is what again? So, sorry. One of the manatees had been run over by a motorboat, had propeller scars down the back. Oh. For this experience. Oh. Family. oh, wow. That's, I, I bet that surprised. I never thought. I think, I think you, can, you, can, you can take that and run, like just run with yeah, it, like yeah. take credit for it. It's very intentional. We passed the manatee for months until we found the perfect propeller scars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That was just a real manatee we found and shot with, but they are manatees were going extinct for a second because it, and now there's a law effective in Florida that protects them and it's very important. So that's why that poor guy has scars on his back. Um, but yeah, I look that's beautiful. <laughs> I'm gonna use that from now on. Okay, so <laughs> one question there, sir. Yeah. So the question is about if there were any songs that was written into the script that didn't make it into the film for clearance or permission reasons. Uh, we basically got insanely blessed um, and it didn't happen. There was one other, uh, when Ty uh, destroys his room, it used to be a runaway, uh, the Kanye track. And it was, uh, I really liked the way like that piano really kind of came in and like built it up as, as he was leading to this moment. Um, but we took it out because they thought it was crazy sending the movie with like more than one song to Kanye and that was unrealistic. <laughs> um, so we took it out and then I got to put, I'm a, I love Tyler the Creator and we got to put in one of his songs. Uh, so that made me really happy. So then once we finally got in, because like trying to get in touch with Kanye and the rights of this song was like six months or something, it was insane. So. Once we finally got in touch and it was working, it was like, no, we're not going to go back and ask for anything else. Um, so that I'd say that was probably the one thing. Besides that, we just got crazy, crazy, crazy lucky. Yeah. So you have so many song cues, and then you're working with the composers. Like, did you give them cues already, or they pitch cues to you? How did that work? Um, I basically, I don't like doing this, but I've done it every movie. I just, I like. I, t I, temp I did temp music throughout the whole thing, and composers hate it. Uh, so Trent and Atticus hated it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, why would you like it? <laughs> but I, yeah, so the f they saw a first cut, basically, and there was a ton of music, and on in addition to that, temp tracks where score could be. Um, but I tried to use their stuff as much as possible, and then they wanted like a lot of notes and ideas, so I sent a very long, pretentious email of <laughs> notes and ideas for what, what I thought the score could be and where it could go. And I think they digested that and then tried to uh, do their own thing with it and like keep it and, and bring themselves in the spirit of that to it. But then at times it became really organic to where they'd send me stuff um, and they we what we realized too is like instead of every other movie I've done, like the score cues were lined up perfectly. We scored exactly the picture, it was locked. This was, we were still editing. So they would, they'd send stuff like locked to picture and sometimes it'd be amazing. Sometimes we weren't loving it and they'd just start sending a ton of music. And then I would start playing with it and moving it around and re poorly re-editing some stuff and then they'd make it good again. But it became very organic to where they'd just send all that, then I'd send a cut back and where it, where it felt like it was going and, and they'd make it good. Better. <laughs> Any question? I have one question, and we can close out. I think uh, just sort of going back to sort of like more emotional territory again. I'm assuming yes, you 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 worked on the film for a long time, so you're used to seeing all this footage, and then now you have watched the finished product many times too. I'm assuming. What what's like one scene that still holds a lot of power for you when you watch it now, where it like, does not lose its power and it's maybe even is more powerful every time you watch it? It's a great question. Um, honest, I mean, to me, the heartbeat of the film is the scene with them in the, in the, at the lake um, and what they're talking about and where they go. Uh, it, and I, and I, I just love Tay and Sterling so much and they put their hearts and souls into it and they tear me apart. I mean, that's a moment. Also the bedroom scene between Sterling and Renee, uh, when Emily's eavesdropping in, I can't, 
there's moments with Renee when she's making down in court, she's like making sounds, <laughs> primal sounds that a mother should never make of like losing your child, which tears me apart and I can't hear. Um, so there's, there's that stuff. And then, um, yeah, there's some stuff with Ty as well. It's about his face at the end of his story. Like I can't, it's really hard for me to, I mean, I still haven't watched the movie with an audience. Uh, it's weird for me. I'm very strange about it and you do it, you do it to death and you get so sick of the movie and numb to it. But then like, there's, there, there's certain moments in it that like still ring back to like the, I guess like the feeling you were kind of originally going for and the fact of like how much I love the, the actors that are doing it and everything. And yeah, it, it, it hits me. So I don't know. I also, I just, I don't like watching it that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should be very proud of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, and of course, the whole reason of having a sneak preview tonight is that you can go tell your family, friends about the film when it comes out in Please. theaters November. Please. Um, so we can make this a hit, guys. We need movies like this need awareness. We need it's not a big movie, so please spread the word if y'all got it. If not, please. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out.